on behalf of the executive, myself, I want to welcome you most sincerely to Government House. Mr. Acting Chairman, I'm truly, truly grateful to you and your members for the unprecedented support that all of you give to me during the election area. Let me let's start our conversation with the easier issues, what I call the softer issues. You recall that I came to teacher's house to meet with you. And that day, it rained. <laughs> and I know how I got out of teacher's house. So I understand firsthand the challenge of the flood in teacher's house. And it is going to be a priority item <coughs> for us. <laughs> SSG, we are going to, we have to speak with the ITEC this week. Let us see what they've done, the designs, and I can assure you it will be a priority project for us. <laughs> I know that the teaching core provides some of our best minds most trained and educated people. That is why my predecessor went beyond the demarcations you used to have to say, why not? If permanent um, teachers, head teachers are good and they've risen to the appropriate grades, 16, 17, why can't they become permanent secretaries? So it's a policy. And there's no way I'm going to change from that policy. Because it's the same as we are, we are consolidating and continuing. If you listen to my budget yesterday, I did emphasize that we want to spend or pay more attention to the human element, the social issues in our society. Because in a recession like this, it is human beings that are most affected. So we cannot ignore that they are plight. Yes, we want to build infrastructure, we want to do many things, but people must leave first before the use infrastructure. So that is one area we are concerned about. And thanks to our President Buhari, he is also very concerned about that. And one of his strat strategies is how to spend our way out of recession in a very sensible and logical manner. So the issue of pension is one that we will deal with. So in this year's budget, what I've said is effective January 1, all of us will now move into the contributory pension arrangement so that by the grace of God the next generation of teachers will not go through what you are going through now. That is the pension money is already there. So the day they finish, it's automatic. You know, the monies are converted into annuities, their liability, the box sum is paid to them and then uh, the rest is end. It's automatic. I was part of that arrangement when Obasan just set up the pension uh, committee to review the pension system. So, by the grace of God, effective January 1, we are cutting everybody over. And we have made provision in the budget for our, that monthly contribution. The contribution monthly is 15%, 10 on behalf of government and 5 on behalf of you. So, of everything you earn, we'll put 15% aside every month until you retire. And so, and that money is there, it's been managed. And it will. But for the legacy issues, the people who have, who you may not qualify to cut over, because this is only going to affect people who are five years and, and above in service. We also have provided money, because this is a problem that was accumulated over a period of time. It's not a problem you can resolve overnight. But because of our commitment, we said, okay, let us put money aside. Uh, at least this year, we're putting about six billion. It will not solve all of it, but at least it's a good start. If we were able to put this kind of amount every year for the next five years, we'll clean out all areas, both gratuity and pension. So it is a plan we have, and by the grace of God, by the end of my tenure, we would have addressed, if not resolved, the pension problems totally. <laughs> and there's nothing new, because I told you all of this when we were, when I came to see you in teacher's house. I'm so glad that you understand the challenge we have. I promise that we will try and create a minimum of 200,000 jobs. The problem is not the jobs. 
The problem is the capacity of people to work, to do the work. So as teachers, you play a very, very fundamental role for the future of this country, not just educating, but for us beginning to think about our curriculum so that the people we produce from our school system, whether it is primary or secondary school, are people who can sustain themselves in life. In those days, standard six, with standard six alone, you are made for life, right? Yes. You can read properly, you can write properly, there's nothing, you are educated, that is, the foundation has been properly laid. That is what I am hoping we can accomplish. So that after primary, after JSS, you should be able to do something with your life. We all seem to make, make it as if it is only when you go to university that you become a successful person. So we all rush to universities and we are producing so much graduates, they cannot help themselves, they cannot employ themselves, and they cannot help society. So it's time to rethink the purpose of education and the kind of education that we are giving our children. For me, I am going to be moving most of our subsidies into vocational and technical education. You know, that is where I feel we should put in more emphasis today. So that by the time a boy or a girl is 16, 17, you can begin to do something for yourself. If you want to proceed to higher education, university, it's an option. You cannot, even on your own, you can even fund it if you so decided. But because you already have something, to, you, 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 what we say, you have your own handwork. I want it to be a goal that when we meet again, we are all thinking and saying, okay, how do we ensure that by the year 2020, any child that comes out of our educational system can be self-employed or has a skill or something doing in addition to the general education we are giving that child. It is a collective responsibility for us all. It is not something we can say one or us in government alone can do. In fact, it is more your challenge than our challenge because you are the people to implement, even when we say this is the way we are going. To do this, we have to train and retrain. So if you notice, some of the things I've been doing, I've been focusing more on the technical schools, schools that will produce manpower. That is why I've gone to, I went to Benin Technical College, I've gone to Taya Bata University of Education. For me, that school is so important for you. We need to have a center of excellence and a reference point for you to determine and help us define the future of our educational system. In addition to that, we're also strengthening our colleges of education. I'm moving in this year's project, if you notice, we're putting money in Igwebe. We're putting money in Afuze to strengthen our teaching core. So training and retraining is something we will have to do. Because for you, you need that fulfillment. When they say teacher's reward is in heaven, what it means is not that teachers will be poor people, but you can look back and say, wow, I made people. But you don't want to look back and say, oh, none of the children that went through you has made it in life. You would, cannot say you're a, you're a success. School supervision, you see, it's all part of the training. It's all part of, it's a system. You know, you can't be talking about school supervision if your training institutions do not even address these issues of school management. What is the role of the head teacher? By the grace of God, when we fin by the time we are finishing, we will have elevated the status of a head teacher or a school headmaster to what we knew it to be growing up. These are leaders in society. You know, not just people you look on to, parents come and shout on. No, because these are people who mold characters, who mold the you know people who I mean the next generation of leaders. So we will look at the school management system and deal with begin to address how do we deal with school supervision? <coughs> because look at it now as an association, as a union, your life is revolves around the school system. 
doesn't it? Yes. So why would you not ensure that just as that is what you are about now, collectively you protect that system and force government to ensure that that protection is guaranteed? Why do you think it's just government's responsibility alone and you don't have any responsibility to protecting those institutions? What in your own capacities have you done? Because it's for us to have effective success, it has to be a collaboration. Not just like you come rather than say, oh, we need to super have schools for our children. We will not sit and say, this is how we should go about supervising our school system. It would be more effective if it came from you, rather than us imposing it. But one thing I think we should look at and think about carefully, this country has, is changing. Let us not deceive ourselves. I'm looking at this letter, dated 25th February. As at 25th February last year, if you look at oil prices were still around 60 something dollars a barrel. Today, or throughout the rest of the year, they were barely, we could barely end 40. But as a state, we were committed and we made sure that there was not one month that we will pay you salaries, in spite of that drop. So there was a good intention in making a commitment to LTG. This is what this means, that here is a government who cares, who is passionate, who wants to give you your dues. But when they don't have the capacity to do it at that point in time, what happens? Do you want to kill them? Is it not the time to be more understanding, to say, OK, we understand things are bad, for you, look at what happened. The local government people have gone on strike. Some of them haven't gotten salaries. They have arrears of about four months, but at least you have your own. How will you now feel now that we have not even, we are still looking for money to give them for Christmas, and you are now saying, no, we must still pay LTG first before we even pay some people their own basic salary. So this is a time that calls for understanding and compassion so that we can get this, thing, this system going. We are transparent. I can show you every cover we earn and where we put it. And you make that determination. There's no, we don't have anything to hide. And I told you that, and I was committed to that, that there will be openness and good governance. That is what we stand for. So it is a liability, it's an obligation. We would love to meet it, but we don't have the capacity to do it now. So our appeal will be, you give us time to at least have the capacity, and once we do, we will do it. We're not denying, and we're not running away from the obligation. I made, had to make sure that salaries are paid this week, for last Friday. I'm telling the local government people they must pay salaries before Thursday. So that, despite the recession, farm people still have something, but no matter how little, to spend Christmas with. So I'm sure that knowing who you are, we will have that cooperation and understanding from you. We will not run away from our liabilities and obligations. We just need to work with you to, make, to realize them. The federal government has created, given us some um, teaching core out of this, their Empower program, about 3,100. We're working with Suburb and to also see how we can retrain them and put them in the system to fill up that, those vacancies which currently exist so that it will address the issue of the shortage of, of teachers. We will provide and we'll provide instruction. I will strive to make sure that we get as much as we can instructional materials. Um, there's no point paying your salary and you don't have the tools to work with. The issue of question papers came up, and I'm saying, okay, as part of our cost-saving property devices, is there no other way we can do it? These are areas we, I would like us to discuss. We shouldn't be fixed in how to do, how to do things in one way. That is, oh, we must print papers. In the age of technology, it can, this exams not be related to you, there are some means without on the phone, so you know. There are, we let us sit down and think. Because the whole idea is how we can 
make more by reducing waste. Let us look at how people have done it in other areas and other jurisdictions. I'm not saying this is a solution, but I'm saying in the West, when we are faced with the kind of challenges we are faced with today, and given the benefit of technology, are there no new options? Must we be fixed in our ways? So to round up, what I can say is that in you, we have a partner. In the NUT, we have a partner. A partner that we trust because you've been open and you were there for us. What we expect now is that by the end of the first quarter next year, I want to have an education round table with the leadership. Let us sit down, remove our coat suits, and talk to ourselves frankly and very honestly and openly about education. What do we need to do to now put a state back in its pride of place in terms of education in this country? Because the country, whether you like it or not, has always looked up to us to provide leadership. And we have, we can actually beat our chest and say we've produced some of the best educationists in this country and the best teachers. So we will sit down first quarter next year. We'll have a session, the leadership, we'll look at it with statistics and data. It is not just statistics. We'll look at each primary school we've renovated. We'll look at the teaching core. We'll look at the supervisory core. We'll look at the ministry. We'll have the data and say, okay, this is where we are. Where should we be? And what must we do? And I'm sure I have your cooperation and support. I want to thank you once again for visiting and say I'm truly grateful. <coughs> Compliments of the season to all of you.